Kyle Klingman with Track Wrestling. We have Matt Lindland, Olympic silver in 2000, world silver in 2001. He is the Greco national team coach. And ASAP, ASAP Rocky is a fan of his. How are you, Matt? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good to see you. Good to have you uh, on the call. And uh, what are we chatting about today, Kyle? Well, I mean, we could start with ASAP Rocky. Have you listened to any of his stuff since you found out he was a fan of yours? No, I mean, I, 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 I dug into a little bit of his stuff. I mean, I think the, the, really the closest I can, I can get to, uh, to really, you know, rap music, maybe a little up church. I mean, I, I, I like some of the old school stuff, you know, back in the early days. Uh, but, uh, yeah, now, nowadays I'm, I'm kind of sticking, sticking to my roots and following the punk in the, the country. You're from Oregon. Why do you think Oregon has such a great tradition in Greco? I, when I think of Greco, it's probably Minnesota and Oregon. There's been a lot of great productivity from there. Why do you think that is? Uh, boy, you know, I think we had some some good coaching early on um, back in the the 80s. Pavel Kotzen, who was uh, our Olympic coach in 1984, moved out to Oregon, uh, got hired. And that was actually the club I ended up uh, going to, not – not because of him. I just, uh, you know, looked at, uh, looked at the podiums and was like, okay, there's a lot of guys standing on top of the podiums from this club. And, you know, and I found, you know, Dan and Joe Russell there and Oscar and Isaac Woods and, you know, Travis West was around. And I mean, there was just so many talented guys, uh, Anthony Amato, Mark Fuller was living out there. I mean, we had some, some really talented guys and Mark was, you know, what was that, uh, 48 kilo or something. Yeah. And I, I think I was about 40, 49 kilo or something. So I, I got to be a training partner with a three-time Olympian when I was, you know, growing up and just starting. So I don't know what it was about, you know, Greco out there that people like to do it. And, uh, and so I got exposed early and, and really enjoyed it, but I will also, headed down a freestyle path for quite a way a while as as well as the college wrestling olympic trials coming up when did you catch the olympic vision you know i caught it early uh when i was when i was doing equestrian sports uh my my coach she was on the uh, olympic team in 1980 kathleen smithwick uh made that olympic team in 80 and i wanted to be an olympian and and then uh Right before I got into high school, my folks, uh, you know, I, I think I've shared this with you, told me we we're too poor to to be a riding sport uh, family. And so I might want to look for another sport. And I found wrestling and, uh, you know, continued that Olympic passion. And I remember watching the 84 games and seeing that we had quite a bit of success. And so I thought that was uh, inspiring to me. And, you know, I figured, you know, heck, you know, four years from now, I could get on a team and four years went by pretty quick and I was, you know, still trying to win a state title. And, uh, and so I was certain 92 was, was going to be my, my chance. I didn't even qualify for the trials. 96, I was confident. I was very sure. And then Gordy hit me with a gut wrench and uh, I gave up two points and I caught him in a gut wrench. And back in those days, it was hand to hand. You only got one. And I scored last, but uh, I only scored one hand-to-hand -hand gut wrench and uh, had to settle for another quad and finally finally made a team and got to the games and uh, got the opportunity to stand on a podium. So uh, pretty feeling pretty blessed about that. We've seen that Greco can be successful. 2007, the United <laughs> States won the World Team Championships. Of course, there's always expectation to get medals and to, to place high as a team. What do you think the right formula is to get Greco where it needs to be in competing for medals and competing for team championships? Well, it's not a very popular opinion, but I think we need to get uh, athletes a little younger. Um, I think we, we need to find athletes that want to bypass the college system uh, about 15, 16, start focusing full-time Greco. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see guys, you know, even, you know, just just have that opportunity to to wrestle more often in, in Greco Roman. But you look at most of the year, you know, there's not even opportunities. You know, it's like folk style is the thing. You know, it's all we're doing and and there's no opportunities. And you go overseas and and you know, you see, you know, gym classes where they're they're pummeling, you know, boys, girls, they're just working on body lock stuff and exposing them to the sport. 
And that's really the only styles that they train is the international style. So, you know, I think for, for our program, it'd be great to get more athletes exposed to um, develop a pipeline and, and a pathway for our athletes to, you know, be exposed to Greco, but also, you know, develop a passion for it and, and follow that passion. And we have some, some coaches and some clubs that are, that are actively pursuing that path, but uh, it's pretty small and we got a big country. Um, and so it's, it's hard to cover all the territories here in the United States. Are you trying to get some of those elite college wrestlers over to Greco? Oh, that's always a, a hope, but you know, with the, with the regional training centers, a lot of that focus for those RTCs is freestyle. And uh, they feel like, you know, the, the RTCs are really developed to help the college programs, you know, produce NCAA all Americans and national champions. And they, they want those guys, you know, bent over grabbing legs and, and, you know, attacking the the legs and not really focusing on Greco. If we had more co- coaches out there in the college system that, that saw value and they, they were willing to invest in, in our Greco Roman athletes, as well as the freestyle, I think that would definitely help. But I mean, you look at, you know, we, we've definitely recruited, we got, we got the, uh, Adam Kuhn and Colton Schultz that are both, you know, college style wrestlers, but, you know, we've, we've definitely recruited those guys. We've gotten Ness and, and Gabe Dean and um, Kokesh. And I mean, we, we put out a, a pretty big recruiting call and tried to develop, you know, those athletes, but it, I think it's really hard for some of these athletes to have success at, at a specific style. And then, realize that, man, they, there's a lot of skills I'm deficient in and I've got to start, you know, pretty much from ground zero. You know, we've, we've had these guys come out. Uh, I, I mean, I think we've talked even about Gabe Dean, you know, he showed up at the U 23s and we spent a lot of time. He's, you know, he's a great wrestler and uh, he just didn't give himself a chance. You know, he, he went in and clubbed the guy in the head a couple of times and the guy rotated and arm through him twice match was over and he grabbed his gear and walked out of the arena. I didn't, didn't even shake anybody's hand or say goodbye. He was done. Uh, but, you know, I see him back in the freestyle bracket here. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with hubris. You know, it, it's, it's tough to take your beatings uh, starting over uh, even though maybe you have a, a, a style that would fit well for Greco Roman. Do you feel good about where we are? What is it? Four weight classes qualified for the Olympics still have two to go. How do we get those two qualified? And you feel like we're in a good space to make that happen. Well, we get those qualified by going to Europe and beating everybody else. that's not qualified. I mean, there's one, one opportunity. It's the last chance in, in Sofia, Bulgaria in May. Uh, I feel great. Um, you know, heavyweight, I think is cleared out after the Europeans this weekend. Um, there, you know, there's still some very talented guys in that bracket, but we, we've got a really strong, we, we're strong at heavyweight. Whoever comes out of that bracket, I think is going to go get, get that done. 77, man, that, that weight class is so deep. We're, we're going to have to have a really good tournament. Uh, again, uh, got some really good guys. I mean, we're deep, we're deep at 77, but, uh, we got to, we got to be strong internationally. We got to go over and compete well on the right day. And I, I really feel confident or, you know, working with a lot of these guys and after the team selected, that's really going to be my main focus is uh, getting out to those athletes and getting training partners to them, helping, helping those two weight classes prepare. And, uh, you know, our first camps will be in, in May in, in Atlanta. And that first one we're going to do is actually going to have all three styles uh, at it. And uh, John Bardis has offered up his facility down in uh, Alpharetta, Georgia, the cooler. Um, yeah, I've done some, I've been there before, but I've, I've uh, seen some up, updates to his facility on FaceTime, walking through the building yesterday with John, uh, just showing me everything he's, he's got down there. And we're, we're super grateful to have that opportunity to go down and train, especially our second camp in July. It's going to be hot and humid. Um, so we'll be able to simulate the conditions in Tokyo. You have said in the past that winning a medal at the Worlds and Olympics, which you've done twice in, in multiple weight classes, however hard you think it is, it's harder than that. Would you elaborate on that and just the degree of difficulty it is to win a medal in Greco? 
Well, I think, you know, I started out with a story of thinking I was going to make a team in 88. And uh, and then I, I felt a, a lot, I had a lot better chances in 92, like I said. And, you know, there right there's two quads. And then uh, put another quad in from, from uh, 96 to 2000. Um, yeah, man, it's just, they're, the world is really good. And they're, they're focused on international styles full time. And I think we start late as a nation because of our college systems. And uh, we, I mean, we have so many great athletes in, in the United States wrestling. We have, we have a lot more participation wrestling, but I think we burn our athletes out early on trying to, uh, you know, win, you know, win junior, you know, kids events and, you know, the junior high, you know, national titles and the, the high school national championships. And the, we have so much emphasis and focus po pushed onto, you know, the athletes. And I understand that, you know, the college is a great thing to get into the college, get a degree, but not necessarily that's for everybody. I think there's a lot of, a lot of guys that think they're going to go to college, get, get that all fully funded and paid for. And that's not really necessarily the case. Uh, you know, these days, uh, I don't even think it was the case in the nineties when, when I was in college, I, I mean, I chose to go to Nebraska because I thought that was going to help prepare me the best to compete. And it wasn't because I, they were offering me the most money. I, I felt like that was a place where I could go and, and, uh, excel, I could get better. And we had a great team and I loved all, all my teammates and enjoyed that experience. But I also, I also recognized that maybe there was a quicker path to getting on a podium and that would have been focusing full-time on, on Greco-Roman wrestling. I think it's, you know, we're, we're seeing that, you know, Colton Schultz uh, took fourth place at, at the NCAAs had a really good tournament, wrestled well as a, as a first year, you know, college wrestler. And, but he's also one of our top guys, you know, not just in, in our country, but he's one of the top guys in the world winning, you know, cadet uh, world championships, uh, junior, you know, he missed the, the 2020, uh, the 2020, I'm trying to think, man, we lost a whole year, Kyle, with this COVID, you know, I, you know, he had, he had a bronze, he had a silver and, and I was really, you know, expecting him to get the gold medal last year at the juniors and he didn't have that opportunity. Um, so that, you know, that hurt, but, you know, just as far as, I mean, the, the amount of sacrifice and the time commitment, you know, the struggles, you know, I was very fortunate. I, I had one injury in my career that was 99, uh, right before, right. It happened at the world championships, but I thought in my mind, that was like the worst time in the, in, in the entire part of my career to get injured was a, a year before the Olympics. It took me off the mat for nearly three months. Um, and then I had another two months of just getting back in shape and recovering uh, from that injury from when I got released back on the mat. But what I realized was um, that was probably a blessing. I, I think I just wore my body down till my arms, the muscles in my arms snapped and, you know, separated and rolled up and I had to get them repaired. But that allowed me to have some time off, some some rest and recovery, refocus um, and, and really charge forward for those next two years. And and that's I think that's really ultimately what helped me uh, get on the podium was was the fact that I finally took a break. I mean, it was just like I thought the harder you work, the harder you grind, just keep pushing through. Um, and I never took the the time to really you know, enjoy it. I was, I was having so much focus put on, on, you know, accomplishing my goals that I, that I stopped really kind of enjoying what I was doing and, and taking that break, you know, and I missed the sport. I missed competing. I missed the training and uh, it, it, it really paid off for me uh, having that break. And so I don't know. I mean, just between injuries, between, uh, you know, the, the amount of things you miss as an athlete, um, you know, it, it's hard to travel when, when you got kids at home, you know, it's like, I don't want to leave my kids and go to, go to Europe for three or four weeks and, and do all these qualifiers and, and competitions. I think those are all, you know, sacrifices you make because you set these goals. A few years ago, I think it was 2017, you had an interview with Andy Hamilton where you really took aim at the culture of Greco-Roman. Are those issues solved? And do you feel like you're in a good space with the culture of Greco right now? I, you know, I remember that. Uh, that 
Um, but, um, you know, I think we're doing great. Uh, we got a really cool project starting up. Uh, and it, it was, it was one of the, really a fun experience. Just the, the first call I had, uh, every, every former national team coach in Greco Roman's history from, from cause to, uh, Mike Houck to Steve Frazier to myself, we were all on that call together along with everybody in our, in our history of our sport. That's been, you know, uh, <clears throat> successful. You know I mean? From, from buyers to rule on to, you know, up and down Dennis Hall, Brandon Paulson. I mean, you can, the, the list goes on and on. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to forget so many people, Joe Warren, Kevin Bracken, but um, John Matthews and, and Jim Martinez, but we got these athletes or got these, these former athletes on a, on a call to talk about this project we want to do, which is a mentoring project for our current athletes. And not only is, is that pro program going to help our athletes, give them a mentor, somebody to talk to, somebody that's been there, gone through the same struggles, had to make the same sacrifices um, <clears throat> and dealt with a lot of the same, you know, struggles and um, throughout their career, have that mentor aligned with our Olympians. And then we'll be able to broaden it out to our entire national team after this year. But it's kind of an important year with the Olympics uh, coming up. So we're going to focus on the Olympians this year, then broaden that out. But I also think it's really, uh, really critical. And I know you're such a historian as, as I am too, of, of the sports reconnecting, re-engaging all of our legends in our sport. Um, I think that type of stuff is going to really, you know, help with our culture, uh, recognizing the, you know, the, the giants that we're standing on their backs. I mean, the guys that went before me, I mean, I, I studied them. I knew who they were. I, I knew where they grew up. I knew, you know, what they've accomplished in our sport and what kind of men they were uh, off of the mat as well. You know, I started to, to learn that you know, when I'd get a chance to meet these guys and, and connect with them, whether it was freestyle or Greco, I wanted to spend time and be around these guys and see what I could learn from them. Um, and sometimes you, 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 you meet some guys that just, they're not great people, but mostly in our sport, we got some pretty incredible human beings. You won't be in the corner for any of the matches at the Olympic trials because you're the national team coach. You're expected to stay neutral, but you're a human being. Do you have favorites in your head that you want to see make the team? Uh, that's a, that's, that, that's a loaded question, isn't it? Um, Here it is. I, I want the best guy on our team, period. I want the guy that's, that's capable of going overseas uh, in Tokyo in August and, and competing for a medal. And that's really all I care about. I, I really, I mean, I, I have some athletes that, that I have, you know, stronger relationships with others, maybe because, you know, they live here in Colorado Springs and I get to, you know, connect with them more often uh, on time. Even my, my army athletes, I haven't even been able to, to go to their practices since this COVID pandemic started. Um, that's been tough. You know, I was, I was enjoying going over to practice, watching Spencer run a practice a couple times a week, uh, getting to connect with the, the, the athletes. And recently it's been a lot of zoom calls and phone calls and one-offs and, you know, sending them videos or, or whatever from, you know, tournaments that have been going on overseas. But honestly, Kyle, I just want the guys that, that are capable of getting on the podium and competing. And I think, you know, I, the wrestling community and you and I know who those guys are and it's, it's two or three in, in each weight class potentially. And uh, the fun part about the Olympic trials is uh, there's always a surprise, isn't there? Every single year, there's a surprise. There's some young guy that's, that's just decided he's going to make that team. Um, but I want that, that young guy that's capable of making that team to be also be capable of uh, competing at the highest level of competition. And so it's really been important to, to pour in and invest in our young athletes as much as it is our veterans. You, of course, transition into mixed martial arts coming from Greco-Roman. There's a good track record of Greco athletes doing well in MMA. Are there some intangible properties that Greco gives you in mixed martial arts? Oh, I, I definitely think so. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest examples, you look at that that fight where um, um, Askren, Ben Askren, where he, he competed against Jorge Mazdabal. And it, his first attack was bend over at the waist and, and run his face into Jorge's knee. And, uh, 
you know, Greco Roman guys usually, you know, we're going to stay a little more upright and do a, a, a boxing or a fighting stance. We're going to get into that clinch position. And once we get into that clinch position, we're, we're able to manipulate our opponent's bodies and uh, get them to the mat. And then once you, you know, the top guy is going to, going to have such an advantage over the bottom guy. I, I don't care how good your jujitsu is. Gravity is a factor. And uh, if uh, the opponent's on top of you and he's able to rain down punches, the guy from the bottoms, you know, he's, he's limited to his attacks. His attacks are, you know, escape, get away from the damage, potentially, you know, sweep your opponent, get on top in a reversal situation. And then there's the occasional submission from the bottom position. And if you're defending those, I mean, gravity wins. And if you can get on top and you know how to control position from the top, it's very similar to it's, it's, uh, the difference between vertical and horizontal Greco-Roman wrestling, you're still digging for underhooks. You're looking for controls, two-on-ones, uh, underhooks, controlling the body and uh, doing damage from top. So I think the, the fact that Greco-Roman wrestlers are positionally very strong once they attach themselves to their opponent, um, the, the, the dangerous part about that is that that range in between where I'm too far away for you to hit me and then that the distance between me being clinched, you know, that boxing range where, you know, the elbows and the knees and the uppercuts start coming into effect and you can catch some of those strikes. And, you know, striking adds a whole nother, uh, you know, element to the, to the sport for sure. You know, and so you gotta, you gotta be, you know, aware of what he's capable of doing, but it's head up, hips in, you know, bend your knees. It, it's basic positioning, you know, I mean, in Greco Roman, we don't really, you know, extend our arms too much when we get a get an underhook because we'll get arm spun. And the same thing, you know, happens if we're extending our body. You know, we're creating space for our opponent to, you know, manipulate um, us. You know, as Greco Roman wrestlers, or or also add the striking into that. So, yeah, I think uh, I think you know, spending years and years in in positions and. And just being really disciplined in your position uh, definitely is an advantage. You know, there's nothing I like better than a good Tolly Thompson story. He was an NCAA champion at Nebraska in 95, World Bronze in 2005. I've heard that you brought Tank Abbott in to work out in the Nebraska room, and he tangled with Tolly a little bit. Do you remember what happened there? Yeah, he Tolly pick him up and slam him over and over and over. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I was just on a, on a call with uh, Chael Sonnen yesterday. I know one of, one of the other favorites out there. And we, we brought up a Tolly Thompson story as well. And that was uh, when Chael and I were in Denver uh, competing for the, uh, I think it was called the World Series of Fight, IFL, World Series of Fighting. And they'd filled the Denver uh, uh, Pepsi Center for this event. And Ron Waterman's opponent was injured or or just didn't show up. I mean, these were early days of MMA and uh, I'd called Tolly like four times that day. I was like, dude, you got to get out here. He's like, well, I don't even know what I'm doing. I've never even done it. I was like, yeah, remember when you just double leg tank and kept slamming them into the mat or the walls in the, in the wrestling room, do that. And then when you get the takedown, just sit up and punch him. Uh, <laughs> So, but no, we never did get Tolly to make that conversion over to, uh, to MMA. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's got all his, uh, his marbles still, maybe, you know, maybe he was smarter than me and never, never took the, the punches to the heads. Um, but, uh, he's doing great out in Iowa and, uh, you know, raising kids. And, uh, I think once he got his last one out of the house in college now, close, get close, close. close. Yeah. I think he's, He's got one more still in high school, right? Yep. You got it. Okay. You got it. Well, you yeah. never disappoint. Thanks for a great interview. Can't wait to see the Olympic trials and what Greco is going to do. You know, we'll be watching. Well, thanks for having me on Kyle. It's always great to connect. We'll see you out in Iowa or Iowa, Texas. That's where we're going.